Welcome to Bharati 100, a podcast dedicated to exploring and celebrating the life and work of one of the most important Indian writers of the modern era, national poet C. Subramania Bharati. This is Meera T. Sundararajan, Bharati's great-granddaughter. C. Subramania Bharati, whose brief life stretched from 1882 to 1921, was the leading poet and writer in the Tamil language of the 20th century. Bharati was a visionary who fought for freedom and human rights during the period of British colonial rule in India. He died exactly 100 years ago, on September 11, 1921. This podcast, dedicated to him, was inspired by a new book that I've just published. It's called The Coming Age, and it's a collection of Bharati's own original writings in the English language. Bharati was a multifaceted talent, and he excelled as a linguist, writing in many languages, including Tamil, Sanskrit, and Hindi, as well as English. He also read in others, including French. Whether you've known about Bharati all your life, or are just discovering him for the first time now, I hope you'll be captivated by this glimpse into a poet's astonishing life and thought through his own words. In South Indian tradition, music and poetry go together. Bharati, like many other South Indian poets, composed the words to his poems and sang them to his own melodies. One of the joys of this podcast is the chance to share some wonderful music from South India with you. We'll have some of Bharati's songs in rarely heard versions, as he originally composed them himself, sung by members of the poet's own family who were trained by him and his wife. We will hear the iconic drum of South India, the Murdangam, played by Patri Satish Kumar, one of the all-time greats on this instrument. We will hear the classical violin of A. Kanyakumari, one of the greatest artists in the world, and of the brilliant Ganesh Rajagopalan, one of the most genial innovators in the Carnatic musical tradition of South India. As we get into some of the more philosophical and mystical sections of the book, I'll also be playing for you some wonderfully evocative piano music of the time. Music will help to transport us back to that time and place, so distant, yet somehow made so near by Bharati's incredibly contemporary words. India of 100 years ago, when Indians were fighting against the oppression of British rule, asserting their right to be recognized as fully human and indeed divine, as Bharati puts it himself, in the eyes of the world. It's a moving, exciting, and colorful time. It's a passionate adventure, seen through the eyes of a man who wrote, he whose poetry is his life, and his life poetry, only he is a true poet. September 11th, 2021 September 11th, 1921. On that day, exactly 100 years ago, in the deep south of the Indian subcontinent, a young man, not yet 39 years old, drew his last breaths. That man was C. Subramania Bharati, now known as the Tamil Mahakavi, the greatest modern writer in the Tamil language. C. Subramania Bharati was my great-grandfather. 
On this anniversary, I feel a tangle of profound personal emotions, including pride, sadness, awe, and a great sense of celebration. On the personal side, I think of Subramaniya Bharati as the passionate lover of his wife, Chalama. I think of him as the doting father of Thangamar, my grandmother, and of Shakuntala, her younger sister. Bharati's work brought deep meaning to my own parents' lives. My mother was a dedicated scholar of Bharati literature. In fact, she was the first person to specialize in the scholarly study of Bharati's works, completing her PhD on him in 1966 at Arnamala University in Chidambaram. My great-grandfather taught his songs as he composed them to his wife, Chalama, and his daughters. In this way, he initiated a family oral tradition in the singing of Bharati songs, which continues to be preserved right up until the present day. He died prematurely. As I said, he was not yet 39 years old, and his short life had been spent in constant struggle against the injustices of British rule. And, it must also be said, against the reactionary elements of his own deeply oppressed Indian society of the day. A life of heroism and sacrifice, and of fascinating, unique experiences, which we will explore in detail in the coming episodes of this podcast. But Bharati's death anniversary now marks extraordinary cause for celebration. Every human life, every human story, has a beginning, a middle, and an end. The end point is often an important moment of assessment and summation of the meaning of that life. In Bharati's case, within the short span of 38 years, where so much seemed to be left unfinished, he nevertheless lived a glorious life and accomplished extraordinary things. When he died, it was not just the occasion of a death, but it was also the wondrous occasion of a birth, in this case the birth of a legacy, Mahakavi Bharati's literary legacy. One hundred years is a significant period of time in the history of literature. In fact, the works of many writers don't survive for a hundred years. But in Bharati's case, his writings have not only survived the lapse of this period of time, but they have also grown in stature and importance, and become more widely disseminated than ever before. Bharati's fame has grown immeasurably during the past century, and his ideas, his visionary, revolutionary ideas, have only increased in relevance over the past century. In fact, I would say that Bharati as a writer has never been more relevant than he is today. His writing in the new book, The Coming Age, is so fresh that it could easily have been written yesterday, today, or even tomorrow. And this is why I chose this title, taken from one of his own essays in the book. He was looking forward to the future. He was writing for us, his readers of today, as much as, and sometimes even more than, those of his own time. Why has Bharati's work survived for a hundred years? Why is it closer to people's hearts and more deeply embedded in their minds than ever before? What does it mean for our future? What will it mean another hundred years from now? It is interesting to consider what has changed in the past hundred years. First and foremost, India gained her independence from British rule. That was in 1947, a full 26 years after Bharati had passed away. And of course, other British colonies also became sovereign states in the decades that followed, gaining independence both from British rule and from other European powers. And yet, today, 
our post-colonial world is far from harmonious. We continue to struggle with inequality. We see the growing frustration and impatience of those who continue to face discrimination, whether on the basis of gender, race, caste, or any other form of prejudice, with the corresponding lack of solutions. Although formal political decolonization occurred, inequality among nations has not been rectified, and it continues to be the norm in today's world order. We've seen the rapid and alarming development of climate change, and this, in some sense, is the ultimate outcome of colonialism as well. It is the result of our exploitative attitude towards both other human beings and nature. In 2021, I think it's fair to say that there is a rising sense of crisis, but at the same time, there is an ever more widespread awareness today that the world must change. This is very encouraging. But how? How are these positive changes going to be brought about? How are we going to establish a world order and a social order where the values that represent our highest and best selves, our humanity, will take center stage? A world of equality and justice? How are we going to ensure our survival as a species? Because without positive change, our very survival seems to be increasingly under threat. Bharati wanted to change the world for the better and he wouldn't have remained idle in the face of crises such as these. Considering the world that we live in today, the continued and indeed unprecedented importance of Bharati's writings is incredibly striking. It is clear that today we have an enormous amount to learn, both from the example that Bharati set in his own life and from his work. In the coming weeks, This podcast will hopefully provide an opportunity to approach these questions through the lens of Bharati's own original words. His writings in the English language presented in this book, edited for the modern reader, and with background information and commentary that draws heavily upon my mother's pioneering work, as well as my own, which I hope listeners will find very interesting and useful. What emerges clearly from the book is that Bharati was a visionary who seemed to see far forward in time, beyond his era, to a future that to most of his contemporaries would have been unknowable and unimaginable. What I like about the title of the book, The Coming Age, is that it captures this visionary aspect of Bharati's genius. He was writing in 1921 and before, but in many cases, as can be seen in this particular collection of his work, He was looking forward to a new age that he believed was coming in the future. Now, Bharati was a very impatient man. He was a revolutionary. He was a passionate poet. He wanted that future to arrive immediately, at the present instant. At the same time, he was a mystic and a wise man. He knew, with absolute certainty, that sooner or later, in the fullness of time, in the moments of ripeness, that future would arrive without fail for humanity. The coming age was the beautiful future that he not only believed in, but, I think, actually saw, that he visualized as a mystic and a visionary. The coming age was to be the age of equality and non-discrimination, of respect for human freedom and for one's fellow human beings, of a life in harmony with one's fellows and with nature. He believed in a rich and meaningful human life at every level, both individual and in terms of institutions and society. His vision was beautiful, idealistic, ardent, and uncompromising. However, it would be absolutely wrong to say that Bharati was in any way naive. This, I think, is one adjective that could never be applied to him. On the contrary, as we can see in the writings included in this book, Bharati was an incredibly well-educated, well-informed, intelligent, ironic, sometimes sarcastic and even cynical writer. He knew very well the shortcomings as well as the potentialities of human nature and human development. 
he was prepared to work with human flaws and failings, as well as human strength and heroism, and proved to be adept at handling both. His secret? His attitude of compassion, and ultimately love towards all beings, which he cultivated throughout his life. It was an attitude that grew out of his deep immersion in Advaita philosophy, the ancient Indian philosophy of the oneness of all creation. The writings in this book are extremely diverse. They show the breadth of Bharati's activities, intellect, education, and interests. They include work that he wrote as a journalist. In fact, Bharati was a professional journalist for many years, and he wrote extensively about Indian and world affairs in English as well as Tamil. There are a number of philosophical essays where Bharati explores Indian culture, and compares Indian and European cultural concepts based on his extensive reading in multiple Indian languages through the medium of English. There are essays about social issues, his analyses of inequality and discrimination, and his rich exploration of possible remedies for this severe social problem. He writes on education and the importance of learning about one's own culture and being in a position to carry it forward for coming generations. There are poetic translations of some of his own poems, and unique, remarkable translations that he has undertaken of works by other Tamil poets, generally Tamil classics. And finally, there are fascinating journal entries, personal thoughts and ideas, personal poems that he chose to write specifically in English. The podcast will be structured around the book. I'd like to have at least one episode which is dedicated to each item in the book. Some of the pieces in the book are quite long, and for those, I may have more than one dedicated episode, where I will discuss the background and some key elements of what Bharati has written. I hope that in the course of these discussions, Bharati will come alive to you. I would like to present a rather complete picture of him as a pan-Indian personality, a Tamil poet and scholar who is educated in Banaras, an internationalist and a universalist, and even as an admirer of European culture, literature, and languages. He loved the romantic works of poet Percy Bysshe Shelley so much that he actually adopted the pen name of Shelley Dawson at one point, meaning devotee or disciple of Shelley and he was also a revolutionary who was profoundly influenced by the ideals of the French Revolution. As many listeners might know, Parati spent more than a decade of his life in Pondicherry, now called Puducherry, which was then a French territory, an enclave carved out of British India by the French. It's one of the key locations I'll be discussing in this podcast. While he was there, Bharati gained extensive exposure to the French language, literature, and history. So he ended up adopting the French revolutionary slogan as his own, using it for his own magazine, Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité, Liberty, Equality, and Brotherhood. That was indeed his credo. I hope that you will come to see and admire Bharati as a great Tamil, a great Indian, a great internationalist and indeed universalist. The French poet Charles Baudelaire refers in one of his poems to les phares, some of the leading lights of humanity, and I think this term applies perfectly to Bharati. I hope that you will come to marvel, as I do, at Bharati's ability to engage with so many different cultures, peoples, and ideas from all around the world, and to do so on terms of equality. Bharati loved the Tamil language, and he loved his country. 
He gave his life for his country. Those words can be applied to him as truly as they can be applied to anyone. And yet, chauvinism was as far from Bharati's mind and personality as it is possible to be. He was able to love his country and his culture, and also to look at them with objectivity. His goal was always improvement, growth, and the achievement of ideals that will, as he said, allow us to be truly, fully human. It's quite difficult for me to contain my excitement as I begin this podcast with every hope that I'll be able to communicate to you a portrait of this extraordinary man and writer. I hope that this podcast will be, for you, a journey into both the past and the future. This podcast is dedicated to my mother, S. Vijaya Bharati. She was a living embodiment of Bharati's poetry, an encyclopedia of knowledge about his life and about everything that he has written. She was totally immersed in his poetry, totally involved in it every day of her life. She personally embodied all of the passion, originality, and energy of her grandfather. I dedicate this work to her with gratitude for the tireless and joyful spirit in which she shared her knowledge with me, and indeed with everyone with whom she came into contact. Here, she sings one of Bharati's love songs in her truly inimitable style, much as her grandfather would very likely have sung it himself. Surya Chandira Ro Vatakariya Vili Kanama Vatakariya Vili Kanama Vatakariya Vili Kanama Vanakarumai Golo Patakarini Karnila Pudavai Kanama Karnila Pudavai Paditanal Vairam Natanadini see you, Terium Natchati Rangaladi Kanama Sole Malar Walio. Kanama Sole Malar Walio Nadi Sundara Punna Gaita Nila Kadala Laye Kanama Nila Kadala Laye Unadi Ninjila Laye Kanadi Kolakuyilo Sai Kanama Kanama Kolakuyilo Sai Unadi Kuralini Mayadi Balai Kumari Adi Kanama Maruba Kadal Gondi 